Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is power factor correction. Our objective is to examine the means of power factor correcting an electrical system. We'll examine electrical properties like source current, apparent, real, and reactive power for power factor corrected systems. Power factor correction is often a great nemesis for many first year electronic students. This needn't be the case. Power factor correction is elegant, cool, and a satisfying real-world application of practical circuit analysis principles. If I was to list my personal favorite electromechanical subjects, power factor correction would be very near the top, if not the top. My hope is that following this lecture, you too will have a greater appreciation of power factor correction, and even if you aren't willing to call it one of your favorite subjects, at least survive a meeting engagement with power factor correction with some level of dignity still intact. This being said, you need to meet me halfway. This lecture operates under the presumption that the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with both AC circuit analysis and AC power calculation. In my personal experience, students having issues with power factor correction don't necessarily struggle with the concepts of power factor correction per se, but rather simply do not possess competent circuit analysis or power calculation skills. In short, if you showed up to this gunfight with a dull knife, be prepared for a quick and bloody end. It is additionally presumed that the viewer has watched both the power and parallel AC circuits and power factor and efficiency in AC circuits lectures. If you recall, the last illustrated examples in these two aforementioned lectures discuss power factor correction on a preparatory level, and this particular lecture operates under the presumption the viewer already has some level of familiarity with power factor correction, introductory as it might be. If you lack the requisite level of familiarity with power factor correction, please review the aforementioned supporting material and return to this lecture when you are so qualified. As a preliminary exercise for our discussion about power factor correction, consider a 120 volts 60 hertz AC source, an electrical load modeled as an impedance of 75 ohms at an angle of 35 degrees at this particular excitation frequency. See if you can solve for the voltage, current, apparent, real, and reactive power, as well as the power factor for the electric load in the present configuration. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Ohm's law demonstrates current through the electrical load will be 1.6 amps at an angle of negative 35 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the electrical load will lag the voltage across it by 35 degrees. Apparent power delivered to the electrical load is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power figure of 192 volt amperes at an angle of 35 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the electrical load is directing 157.3 watts towards real power and 110.1 vars towards a reactive interchange. Finally, it can be said that the electrical load has a lagging power factor of roughly 0.82. Let's put these initial figures aside as a basis of comparison for the upcoming exercise. By the way, if your answers don't match those illustrated, you are simply not qualified to discuss power factor correction. If I was one of those teachers you see in bad after school specials, I'd say, just believe in yourself and you can do anything. But I'm not, and I'm more liable to say, go away and don't come back until you've brought yourself up to speed. Assuming you're still with me, let's examine power factor correction in general terms. Without stretching the truth too much, Capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another in terms of electrical properties. Capacitive elements have negative complex impedance angles, whereas inductive elements have positive complex impedance angles. Capacitive complex impedance magnitude decreases at higher frequencies, whereas inductive complex impedance magnitude increases at higher frequencies. Current through capacitors lead voltage by 90 degrees. In contrast, current through inductors lag voltage by 90 degrees. Reactive power polarity for capacitors is negative, whereas inductive reactive power polarity is positive. I've even heard capacitors taste like chocolate and inductors taste like vanilla. They are total opposite of each other in almost every sense. Bonus points if you manage to trick your lazy lab partner into eating a capacitor or inductor. Keeping with this theme, a power factor corrected circuit is one in which the reactive power of a fixed load is counteracted by an equal yet opposite variable reactive element such that total apparent power is directed solely towards real power 
and none of it towards a reactive interchange. To say no apparent power is directed towards a reactive interchange is a little bit of a lie. In reality, there will be a continuous, equal, yet opposite exchange of reactive power between the two reactive elements internal to the circuit. However, quite like positive and negative, yin and yang, fire and water, or chocolate and vanilla, they balance each other out such that in summation, there appears to be no total reactive power. It should be noted that most small-scale power factor correction scenarios involve the placement of a variable power factor correcting capacitor in parallel with an electrical load that exhibits inductive characteristics and not the other way around. The reason behind the regularity of this arrangement is that ordinarily the electrical load in question being power factor corrected is in fact a motor which ordinarily exhibits inductive behavior. Conceptually, you might think of a power factor corrected circuit in the following fashion. For a perfectly power factor corrected circuit, the moment the inductive portion of the load is building and sucking in current of a given magnitude, the power factor correcting capacitor is discharging that exact same amount of current. In this sense, the power factor correcting capacitor is dumping all its stored power into the inductive portion of the load just when it demands it. At the opposite end of the cycle, the moment when the inductive magnetic field is collapsing and squeezing out current of a given magnitude, the power factor correcting capacitor is charging and sucking in this exact same amount of current. In this sense, the inductive portion of the load is dumping all of its stored power into the power factor correcting capacitor just when it needs to get rid of it. This is perhaps the origin of the terminology absorb and supply with respect to reactive power. Inductors are known to absorb or consume reactive power and are so indicated with a positive sign. Capacitors, in contrast, are known to supply reactive power and are so indicated with a negative sign. Again, I find these terms somewhat regrettable since reactive power is not truly consumed nor supplied, but rather continually exchanged. However, in this application, I do find they're somewhat fitting. It doesn't mean I like it, but I can understand it. In a perfectly power factor corrected circuit, an equal and opposite amount of reactive power simply bounces back and forth between the two reactive elements. Importantly, given this cyclical exchange occurs within the circuit itself, the source doesn't need to provide reactive power over a distance. As such, we might expect source current to not only be smaller in magnitude, but also perfectly in phase with the supply voltage. In summary, a power factor corrected system will draw less source current, yet experience the same amount of real power. This is the single most fascinating aspect of power factor correction and the reason why it's one of my favorite subjects. By balancing the reactive power requirements internal to the circuit, you get the same results for less input. Let's return to our previous illustrated example and see if we can power factor correct it and then compare and contrast the electrical properties with our previous implementation. As our previous calculations demonstrated, our electrical load exhibits inductive characteristics, and we need to install a variable power factor correcting capacitor in parallel. Then, we need to adjust this capacitance value such that power factor corrects the system. Don't make power factor correction hard. Capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another. Given we previously demonstrated that the load is consuming positive 110.1 bars of reactive power, the power factor correcting capacitor needs to be adjusted such that it will supply negative 110.1 bars of reactive power. Can you dig it? Capacitors and inductors have equal and opposite natures. The harder portion of power factor correction deals with determining the impedance and actual capacitance value that will achieve this ideal scenario. This being said, it's not that hard if you're skilled at manipulating Ohm's law and or the AC power equation. There's a couple means of arriving at these figures. However, I find the easiest, most direct means of doing so is to use this formula. Apparent power equals the complex conjugate of voltage squared divided by impedance. In this case, we know that the variable power factor correcting capacitor needs to supply 110 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees of apparent power. Given we know our desired apparent power figure and we know the voltage in this perfectly parallel circuit, we can rearrange this equation to solve for impedance, where impedance equals voltage squared divided by the complex conjugate of apparent power. 
Don't get mixed up by angles and signs here. You know the apparent power for the power factor correcting capacitor has an angle of negative 90 degrees. You know capacitive reactive power has a negative value. You know capacitive complex impedance has an angle of negative 90 degrees. Just solve for the magnitude of the impedance, add an angle of negative 90 degrees behind it, and call it good. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an impedance figure of roughly 130.8 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. All we need to do now is to calculate the capacitance value necessary to achieve this desired impedance at the given excitation frequency, in this case, 60 Hz. Given we know our desired impedance magnitude and the excitation frequency, we can rearrange the capacitive complex impedance formula to solve for capacitance, where capacitance equals 1 over 2 pi f times the impedance magnitude. Again, don't worry about angles. You know capacitive complex impedance has an angle of negative 90 degrees. Just solve for the capacitance value that yields the desired magnitude. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at a capacitance of roughly 20.3 microfarads. Let's now examine how this upgraded system, now including the 20.3 microfarad power factor correcting capacitor in parallel with our electrical load operates. Both the electrical load and power factor correcting capacitor appear to be perfectly in parallel with a 120 volt 60 hertz AC source. From the electrical load's perspective, nothing has changed because it's still perfectly in parallel with a 120 volt 60 hertz AC source. As previously, the load continues to draw 1.6 amps of current at an angle of negative 35 degrees, and apparent power delivered to the electrical load is 192 volt amperes at an angle of 35 degrees, of which 157.3 watts is directed towards real power and 110.1 bars is directed towards a reactive interchange. The addition of the power factor correcting capacitor in parallel, however, includes another path for source current. At an excitation frequency of 60 Hz, the power factor correcting capacitor, set at 20.3 microfarads, presents an impedance of 130.8 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Ohm's law demonstrates current through the power factor correcting capacitor will be approximately 917.7 milliamperes at an angle of positive 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the power factor correcting capacitor leads voltage across it by 90 degrees. Apparent power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power figure of 110.1 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the power factor correcting capacitor is directing zero watts towards real power and negative 110.1 bars towards a reactive interchange. O, M, G. As we anticipated, the reactive power supplied by the power factor correcting capacitor is in fact equal in magnitude yet of opposite polarity as that consumed by the inductive reactive portion of the electrical load. Like one might expect, capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another. You'd think with this additional path in parallel that source current would increase, but closer inspection reveals something interesting. Look at the angles. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of our present configuration, including the power factor correcting capacitor, demonstrates source current equals current to the load plus current to the power factor correcting capacitor. Substituting in our given values shows source current is 1.3 amps at an angle of zero degrees. Not only has source current magnitude decreased in comparison to our non-power factor corrected circuit, it also appears to be in phase with the supply voltage. By the way, if you're following this illustrated example as I expect you to, a scientific calculator may express the above answer as approximately 1.3 amps with an extremely small angle on the order of pico or femto degrees. Angles with a magnitude of femto degrees means zero degrees and current is in phase with voltage. You may have to scroll your screen left or right to get the whole picture. When we look at the complete system, total apparent power is the summation of apparent power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor plus apparent power delivered to the electrical load. Substituting our given values, you have the total apparent power figure of 157.3 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Similarly, one can solve for total real power 
or total real power is the summation of real power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor plus real power delivered to the electrical load. Substituting our given values yields a total real power figure of 157.3 watts. Finally, one could solve for total reactive power, where total reactive power is the summation of reactive power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor plus reactive power delivered to the electrical load. Substituting in our given values yields a total reactive power figure of zero vars. As we anticipated, the equal and opposite reactive natures of the power factor correcting capacitor and the inductive portion of the load effectively cancel each other out. As a means of checking our work, total apparent power is the complex conjugate of supply voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we again arrive at a total apparent power figure of 157.3 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees, meaning 157.3 watts of which is directed towards real power and zero vars of which is directed towards the reactive interchange. Is it really zero vars? No, no it is not. The inductive portion of the electrical load really is consuming positive 110.1 vars and the power factor correcting capacitor really is supplying negative 110.1 vars. The deal is they're juggling reactive power back and forth with each other and the source stays out of it. That's the point. Power factor correction balances the reactive power requirements internal to the circuit such that the source doesn't need to supply reactive power. As such, source current drops and appears to be in phase with the supply voltage. Power factor correction, if you think about it, is a cunning means of tricking a source into thinking it's providing only real power. From the perspective of the source, it delivers 157.3 volt amperes of apparent power and all 157.3 watts of which is directed towards real power. Can you dig it? This system has been power factor corrected to one, hence the name, and not only is all of apparent power being directed towards real power, source current also appears to be in phase with the supply voltage. Take a moment to compare and contrast the electrical properties of the original non-power factor corrected circuit with those of the power factor corrected system. You note both loads draw the same amount of current and experience the same amount of real and reactive power. Source current, however, is lower and perfectly in phase with supply voltage for the power factor corrected system. The reactive power supplied by the power factor corrected capacitor is equal in magnitude, yet of opposite polarity of that absorbed by the inductive portion of the electrical load. Now that we've got a basic conceptual understanding of power factor correction, and explored a practical application of this technique, let's discuss why this practice is important. Power factor correction is not just some flashy party trick for math nerds, but rather it's essential to the proper, efficient, and economical management of a larger power distribution system. Thus far, we've limited ourselves to just the observable effects of power factor correction inside a tiny room consisting of a source and an electrical load that needs to be power factor corrected. One only needs to walk outside this tiny room to realize the error of this limited viewpoint. Power needs to get to the room from somewhere else. Yes, at the point of use, the source does indeed appear to be 120 volts at an angle of zero degrees, and the losses from the plug to the motor are considered negligible, but outside the room, they most certainly are not. I'll deal with AC power transmission in greater detail in much later lectures, but as an extremely simplified example, Consider a generation facility as some other source in series with a transmission line with a given impedance, in this case modeled as a 5 ohm resistor. The magnitude of the generation facility source is such that it accounts for any voltage drop across the 5 ohm transmission line and at the point of use, i.e. inside the room, it does indeed appear to be 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. That's the job of the electrical utility to manage the generating and transmission facilities such that there always appears to be a stable voltage at the point of use. Using this expanded perspective, let's compare and contrast our original unmodified non-power factor corrected circuit with that of our power factor corrected system. For our original non-power factor corrected circuit, we're aware that the electrical load draws 1.6 amps of current at an angle of negative 35 degrees. This also implies that the 5 ohm transmission line also carries 1.6 amps of current at an angle of negative 35 degrees, 
Because we know the transmission line is assumed to be purely resistive, we know current will be in phase with the voltage across it. Since we're presently unaware of the generating facility voltage magnitude, nor the voltage drop across the transmission line, we can use an alternate iteration of the power formula to solve for the losses in the transmission line. Apparent power consumed by the transmission line is the complex conjugative current squared times the impedance. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power figure of 12.8 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the transmission line is directing 12.8 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. Using this larger, more inclusive perspective, it can be said that the generating facility is now delivering power to two loads, where the transmission line consumes 12.8 watts and the electrical load consumes 157.3 watts. Given the 12.8 watts of real power dissipated by the transmission line is considered a loss to this system, this larger system can be considered 92.5% efficient. Let's now examine the power factor corrected system. Given the power factor corrected system drew less source current, we might anticipate less loss in the transmission line and as a result, increased efficiency. Let's see if this is the case. The power factor corrected system draws roughly 1.3 amps of current at an angle of zero degrees. This also implies that the five ohm transmission line also carries 1.3 amps of current at an angle of zero degrees. Because the transmission line is assumed to be purely resistive, we know current will be in phase with the voltage across it. As previously, we can use an alternate iteration of the power formula to solve for losses in the power transmission line. Apparent power consumed by the transmission line is the complex conjugate of current squared times impedance. Substituting in our given values, yields an apparent power figure of 8.6 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the transmission line is directing 8.6 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. Using this larger, more inclusive perspective, it can be said that the generating facility is now supplying two loads, where the transmission line is consuming 8.6 watts and the electrical load is consuming 157.3 watts. Given the 8.6 watts of real power dissipated by the transmission line is considered a loss, the efficiency of this larger system can be considered 94.8%. Take a moment to consider the implications of this more inclusive perspective. You note know, by power factor correcting the system inside the room, it increased the efficiency of the larger power distribution system external to the room. Power factor correction essentially frees the generating facility from exchanging reactive power with the system over a distance, given all reactive power requirements are locally juggled back and forth inside the system itself. As a result, source current external to the power factor corrected system needn't be as high. In summary, same real power for less source current yields greater power distribution efficiency. That's why power factor correction is so important. Power factor correction is a necessary technique to the efficient management, generation, transmission, and use of power. More to the point, oftentimes industrial users of electricity pay out of a bodily orifice for systems with poor power factor, and as such, it's financially imperative that local systems appear to the utility as an electrical load with unity power factor. Unity power factor, by the way, means a power factor of one. It is for this reason large factories might have their own means of power factor correcting the entire factory rather than individual loads. Conceptually, one might think of this factory scale power factor correction system as a bank of capacitors that are switched in and switched out as reactive power requirements internal to the factory ebb and flow. By the way, the simplification isn't that far from the truth. In much later lectures, we'll examine static VAR compensation, SVC, static synchronous compensation, STATCOM, and synchronous condensers, all means of power factor correcting a system, some more advanced and responsive than others. Additionally, I'll come back to clarify and correct the cartoonish simplifications I made earlier regarding power generation or transmission. We'll learn in later lectures that electrical devices known as transformers are integral elements to the transmission of power over long distances with little losses, and in much, much later lectures that compensating substations use techniques akin to power factor correction to manage not only power transmission, but also distribution voltage such that voltage magnitude remains constant at the point of use despite variations in demand. Until then, 
This concludes this lecture. For those seeking more guidance on power factor correction, rest easy. I'll publish another complete lecture featuring solely illustrated examples of power factor correction. In conclusion, this lecture examined power factor correction for AC circuits. We learned that power factor correction is the addition of a variable reactive element in parallel to an electrical load, adjusted such that its reactive power is equal in magnitude, yet of opposite polarity as that consumed by the electrical load. A properly power factor corrected system will deliver the same amount of real power, yet will draw less source current. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.